Uh, good afternoon and welcome to what uh, looks like the Women's Studies and Religion Program Bistro or uh, uh, Cabaret. It's great to see you this afternoon. Um, we did decide to try to take a lighter approach to our introductory panel this year. Um, I see a lot of new faces, a lot of old faces. Welcome back to our uh, old friends and a special welcome to the new students who are here. Um, as I just have to say this, every time I stand up, you'll hear these words come out of my mouth that every year the Women's Studies and Religion program brings five scholars doing cutting edge work on a book length project advancing our knowledge in Women's Studies and Religion. And that's what we're here to hear about today, the five new scholars who are here to join us this year. Um, just a couple of words of introduction about the program before we get on to today's panel that you all uh, came for. We, on each table that you're sitting at, there's a book in the middle of the table. Um, everybody see your book? That, that is a book that was um, written by someone who was in the Women's Studies and Religion program. And it, you can pass them around and share them. You might not have the one that hits your particular interests at your table. Um, uh, anybody have a really good one at your table that you are dying to read? <laughs> Connie, what do you have? Amy Lang's book on Anne Hutchison. Thank you. Well, there's a lot of great books that uh, have come out of the program. I, some of the best, the greatest hits of the Women's Studies and Religion program are displayed over here. Um, of course, Karen King's Mary of Magdala, um, um, Anne Klein's Meeting the Great Bliss Queen, classics of Women's Studies and Religion, Karen McCarthy Brown's Mama Lola that I'm sure a lot of you have read in class. Um, other new and old uh, works, some that have just come out this year, Carol Duncan's book on the spiritual Baptist in Toronto. We're really excited to see that uh, in print with a gorgeous cover, as well as a new book on um, images of Eve in uh, modern and ancient Hebrew poetry. Uh, anyway, a lot of great books. We can't wait to see the five new books that will come out of this group. They're working on really interesting projects. Um, uh, and um, without further ado, we're go I'm going to introduce them to you so we can start, start to learn about those. Um, we have some disagreement about the alphabet, the alphabet but I'm going to introduce first Karen Trimble Alien, okay? Um, uh, who's going to be our the first person we're going to get to know, and in keeping with our light and lightly cabaret atmosphere, we've asked each um, speaker to talk for five minutes, and then we've asked one of her colleagues to um, ask a quest some questions about what she would really like to know about this project, and then we will turn to you for your questions. Um, do we? Does everybody have a list of the topics, the speakers and the topics? Okay, you all have that. So you. You don't have to be madly scribbling, um, but let me let me introduce Karen Trimble Allium. Um, Karen is associate professor of theology and co-director of the women's studies program at Lewis University in Illinois. She received her doctorate in theology and ethics from Duke University, where she also did the certificate in women's studies. Um, and I meant to ask you before I stood up here, but in keeping with our informal atmosphere, I'll ask you now, um, if, is the manuscript still under review? Yeah. Yes, great. Um, her book manuscript, Reassembling Christ, Feminist Christology, Identity Politics, and the Imagination of Christian Communities um, is under revision for the Columbia <laughs> University Press series, Gender Theory and Religion, edited by Amy Hollywood. And um, Karen has done a lot of work um, bringing together uh, the classic teachings of Roman Catholicism with con contemporary feminist theory. Um, one of her essays, Disturbing, Disturbingly Catholic, 
Thinking the Inordinate Body appeared in a volume of essays on religion and Judith Butler uh, entitled Bodily Citations, and that gives you a sense of the kinds of issues Karen is bringing together. And I will turn the podium to her. Hi, welcome. Uh, the food looks great. We can't wait to, to get out there and have some. So um, for my five minutes, I'll try to stick to that. Um, the title of the project that I'm working on while I'm here at um, WSRP at HDS, I finally got the acronym straight, I think, um, is Bodies in Motion, Theologizing the Body in Feminist, Catholic, and Cultural Contexts. Um, as Anne mentioned, um, I started thinking about more specific body issues a while ago, hence the essay in a volume entitled Bodily Citations um, that drew on um, different religionists and theologians who happen to be using the work of Judith Butler specifically or you know, responding to her in some way. And um, this kind of picks up that trajectory and, and hopefully takes it further. Um, I've been thinking about these things for a long time. Actually, 10 years ago, I had to stop and think. Um, 1998, I presented at a conference in uh, Manchester, England, and the title of the conference was After the Body. Um, and I thought at the time the title might have been a little bit premature, and I still think that it is, because I still think that a lot of really interesting things are going on, especially in feminist theological and Catholic circles, um, to do with the body. There's certainly a lot of things going on, and so, Part of my agenda is to really um, dive more deeply into those developments than I've been able to in my previous work so far. Um, and so I'm curious about the fact that on one hand, in some kind of religious studies theoretical circles, you can have a conference 10 years ago called After the Body, right? Has the body been completely deconstructed? Has it been dissolved into language? As people, feminist theologians among them, tend often to complain. Um, and yet, um, in a lot of Catholic feminist circles, it seems like there's still really lively debate discussion going on about the status of the body, um, what it really means, um, how the body can best be understood and construed in a liberating way for women um, you know, across cultures. And so I really wanted to explore this idea of whether the nature and meaning of the body was, was so very stable after all. Um, in some places it seems very stable, unchangingly stable, and the main place um, that we find a very um, stable and unchanging body is, of course, in official Catholic teaching. Um, and so one of the things I wanted to take a look at um, was John Paul II's Theology of the Body, which I'm really just getting around to. I know it's been out there for ages. He gave a series of catechetical talks to general audiences. I always wonder who was in these audiences. Imagine them listening to these talks. but. Um, they kind of get lumped together under the heading of the Theology of the Body. He gave these back in the 80s. They've been published in a couple of different editions, and one um, newer translation and edition just came out. Um, and it's been sparking some conversation among um, my students, and that's one of the things that really got me started thinking about this. I had one student toting around under his arm his Xeroxes of all of John Paul II's speeches on Theology of the Body, and he would just open it and quote, and he was just so enraptured with these teachings, he was so excited about passing them on to his students. He was a youth minister in a parish, um, and I, he was in my women and religion class at the time, and let's just say this made for a lot of really lively debates as we're reading feminist theory, and, and you know, he's always trotting out his compendium, and I thought, okay, I have no excuse now. I really, really, really have to start diving again more deeply into my own tradition, which is funny. I mean, I was trained at, at Duke, um, in a very ecumenical way. I, I joked that I didn't know how Catholic I was until I got to Duke and met all these people who were quoting scripture from memory, and I thought this was extremely odd and bizarre, and people in my world just never did this. So it was a really good education, um, especially in feminist theory and theology, because you know it's impossible to do feminist theology without being very ecumenical, and so I try to retain that focus. But at the same time, I think that the Catholic teachings are... Um, you know, so popular among certain segments of the Catholic um, population, particularly among the young adults that I'm running to in my, into in my classes. And so I wanted to investigate that. Um, and so I started to do that. Um, one uh, Catholic thinker um, has theorized, David Cloutier, that the reason that the theology of the body 
is so popular, especially in, I should, I should point out that not all my students are toting around the entire compendium of John Paul's original works, but there are lots of popularizations of the works out there. Christopher West um, is probably one of the most um, well-known of the, you know, the popularizers for the people in the pew. And so, um, anyway, David Cloutier um, surmises that one of the reasons that this theology of the body is so popular among his students and other young Catholics is that um, it does this very cool, tricky thing, and I'm still trying to figure out how John Paul does it, um, that it really reiterates the same traditional teachings, right, men and women, um, as, you know, as meant to be, you know, married, heterosexual marriage, um, the complementary theory of the body, right, men and women complementing one another, kind of, you know, that's been in the tradition for a long time, but it couches it in terms or at least Christopher West and other popularizers managed to couch it in terms that are really appealing to um, a kind of quest for authenticity that, you know, again, studies show that many young people are looking for. Um, you know, you ask students, I, you know, they say, I'm not religious, I'm spiritual. What does that mean? I'm looking for meaning in my relationships and my life, and the fact that I'm faced with this wide array of choices is actually a bit daunting, and I want some clear, straight answers. And if my tradition can give them to me in a really appealing way, fabulous. And so I think, um, you know, I'm kind of paraphrasing Cloutier, he says that the theology of the body really draws on that hunger for authenticity um, and um, the idea of using one's own experience to test the truth of a theory. And so I really want to investigate um, more deeply how that works. So in a sense, the theology of the body um, is my jumping off point because, again, that's one of the things that's going on. Um, it's not popular with everybody. <laughs> um, there's certainly a lot of criticism, a lot of dialogue among feminist theologians um, that I also want to explore in a deeper fashion. Um, and so, but I kind of want to begin with that idea that you know why have these teachings hit a chord among the population that in, in which they've done so? Um, how can some of that great enthusiasm, perhaps? in my constructive agenda, be harnessed to more, um, what I would consider more just ends, more inclusive ends, more liberating ends. Um, can feminist theologians, and they are doing it, um, can we continue to rethink um, ideas about gender, sexuality, um, in ways that don't necessarily reiterate um, the, the constraints, the limitations, the oppressions that some of the traditional views seem to, seem to have imposed on people? And so there's a couple different directions I want to go in, and I imagine that the writing I would like to produce this year will be in the form of a couple different articles that could eventually become chapters in a new project. Um, and so on the one hand, um, th this is the section I'm kind of calling Romancing the Body. I change titles all the time. The title of this changed about five times before I actually submitted it. But um, I think of this one piece that I want to do as kind of a Romancing the Body, the idea that um, I've always been interested in the question of, um, that, that's probably been most recently pursued um, in, a, in a kind of different arena by Saba Mahmoud's work on um, the piety of devout Muslim women. Um, but that idea of, you know, as a feminist theorist, as a feminist theologian, can I attribute kind of false consciousness or delusion to women who are living out their religious faith in a way that I just would not choose to do? You know, how can I understand that and not label it in a way that is, you know, demeaning to their very real um, subjectivity and agency and what they choose to do. Um, and so one of the analogies that I've been playing with, again, for a long time, and I'm kind of coming back to it, um, is the idea that of doing a kind of internal critique of the theology of the body and kind of surrounding discourses. Um, again, to quote um, a helpful observer um, that says, mutual self-giving love over a lifetime is a messy thing. The Pope's vision is not very engaged in this messiness. And so, you know, anyone who's in any kind of relationship at all can say, can right away realize that that's very true. Um, how do we get away from the, the over-idealization of certain types of relationships into a real engagement with the messiness of everyday life and all different types of relationships um, and how they can help empower and liberate people? Um, and so the analogy that I think of um, is I want to think about the way that the uses, the pleasures, the attractions, and the dangers of the theology of the body, kind of broadly construed, um, 
of this um, understanding of the body for women can be illuminated, and that is through the analogy of reading romance novels. There's been a lot of really interesting feminist theoretical work done on that, um, some of which I you know, explored in graduate school, and there's still things going on today. Um, so the idea that, okay, does this discourse work only in one way to kind of imprint a gender identity on people? Um, I don't think that it does. Um, and so in the same way that um, theorists have, have looked at romance novels, you know, say back in the 70s and 80s as, oh, they're terrible, you know, women shouldn't be reading them, they're brainwashing you into thinking that a happy marriage is, you know, the only end of your life and things always turn out well, you know, and the formula romance kind of has its happy ending always. Um, to a kind of um, later, maybe more sophisticated take at how women were actually reading and understanding and kind of um, making their peace with or criticizing you know, what was going on in those novels. And I think a similar kind of dynamic goes on um, among different readers and kind of partakers of the theology on body, marriage, sex, gender, procreation, et cetera, that, that comes from the Catholic magisterium. So that's one kind of um, direction I want to pursue. And the other, is to kind of, again, begin with theology of the body as a jumping off point, but maybe um, widen it a little bit. Another strand of criticism I'm finding really interesting, um, another line of engagement with this theology, is the sense that, and here I just have to read this quote, because this will encapsulate it quickly. I know I'm running out of time. Um, his most recent, uh, the Pope, uh, the late Pope's most recent translator um, of the theology of the body says, Oh, I can't, of course, I can't find the quote now. But basically, um, John Paul himself says, and his translators concur, that for John Paul, at least in these writings, the spousal meaning of the body, this kind of image that's unpacked in these writings, is pretty much the Rosetta Stone to the entire Catholic theology of everything, redemption, sanctification. And so I just found that an amazing kind of statement that, again, I want to explore and unpack. How can what you do with your genitals be the key to every, absolutely everything else? And it just seems like a lot of weight is put on this claim for this one area of human activity. And we're all familiar with the idea that, oh, if, you know, Catholicism is in the news, it's always about sex, or it's the Pope and his cool outfit, you know, or it's the smoke going up in the Vatican. You know, that there's only certain things that seem to get covered, but it might be more productive to look at theology about sex, gender, et cetera, in um, a social justice frame in which the Catholic tradition has much more, I think, interesting and enlightening things to say. Um, and, and other you know, thinkers agree with me, and I want to kind of join in with them in saying let's widen the framework in which we think about what a theology of the body might mean um, beyond sex. Um, what does it mean about um, the poor embracing um, you know, people in different parts of the world? I mean, it's just about a lot more than you know, slot A and tab B. <laughs> I'll stop there. Okay. Put that in. Okay. Don't go away. Don't go away. Wait, and Thea's going to um, offer a question. Oh, so yeah. I have to ask you. I have one question. So after saying all this, I'm going to ask you a magisterium question. Um, how do you see your relationship to the magisterium based on what you're doing? Especially since you're talking a lot about John Paul II, who people have right. either very good thoughts about or not so good thoughts about. Right. Well, you know, it's interesting. I guess I, I guess I got a taste of that, you know, in my classroom where I was kind of involved in a strange way with these students who were so enraptured with these teachings and just, you know, trying to, um, you know, and in the same class I had students who um, either weren't Catholic or, you know, didn't really know the teachings very well and were feeling very intimidated by the students' abilities to quote John Paul from memory. And so we had to kind of work around that idea that, um, you know, we had, to, we had to talk about things like infallibility and when it is and is not applicable in the Catholic world and whether or not one can use one's conscience to think about these things. And so um, I guess... Um, I, I said this to you earlier, so I'll repeat it now. I often think of a graduate school friend um, when asked if he was Catholic, he said, I'm loosely affiliated with the Bishop of Rome. And I sometimes think that that's just my answer, but it changes day to day, to be absolutely honest. Um, I think, too, that to work in feminist theology is, an, I, you know, I'm going to put this as tactfully as I can, to work in a larger world sometimes than the world that's available to you if you only... Um, I don't know. I think the, the world of Catholic theology is both amazingly capacious in many areas about social justice, about anti-war, about many things. 
Um, and in other areas, I think it needs some help, and I think that's what we're here to do, those of us who continue to claim the name Catholic. Um, you know, I, I have students say to me, right, like the title of my course, Feminism and Catholicism, isn't that an oxymoron, you know, how do those two things fit together? Um, because I say they do, you know, so I kind of retreat to this nominalist position. Well, I say I'm feminist and I say I'm Catholic and therefore they fit together. But of course, you know, I work at <laughs> how that fit works. Um, and I concur with, you know, in another context, um, you know, Judith Plaska, right, asked this question, how can I be Jewish and how can I be a feminist? Right, given some of the, the patriarchal nature of the tradition in which I live. And, you know, I, I have to answer that same question too. Um, and I guess I just um, would say, well, it's my tradition too. I don't think that, you know, John Paul II, um, how, however, um, you know, wonderful he was in some ways, but, you know, maybe not so wonderful in other ways. I don't know. I think, I think um, it's possible to have a dialogue with the tradition and to have critique that is still faithful to the spirit of the tradition. And so I guess that's where I place myself. Thank you. Oh, she goes back. It's my Okay. Oh, okay. Um, all right, we are going to change the order. And, um, or, I shouldn't say change the order, but not observe the alphabet. And I'm next going to introduce uh, Ping Yao. Um, Ping Yao is professor of history at California State University, Los Angeles, where she teaches courses in Chinese history, Japanese history, women's history, religion and society in Chinese history, as well as Asian American history. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. She. Uh, I, I don't know how to explain the breadth of her, what she has taken on in her scholarship. Um, uh, she has published extensively in both English and Chinese. She co-authored Sharing the World Stage, Biography and Gender in World History, which was recently published, as well as East Asian Voices, Sources for East Asian Civilization. Um, she, her own work is represented in the prize-winning monograph, Women's Lives in Tang, China. But in her spare time, she is co-editing a 10-volume series introducing Western scholarship on Chinese history to academic historians in China. Um, I hope that that's not a short time frame on that uh, project. But let me ask uh, Ping to next introduce her work. for your very nice introduction. Uh, my topic is Good Karma Connections, Buddhist Women in Tang China. And as you all know, the Tang Dynasty is the golden era of Chinese history, and also the golden era in the history of Buddhism in China. And my proposed work um, has two broader um, purposes. First of all, I intend to counter the conventional view that the Confucianism alone was the source for women's inspiration or um, the single most important uh, basis for gender ideology in traditional China or gender institutions in traditional China. So that's my one purpose. Um, my second purpose is to show that we cannot totally, fully understand uh, women uh, understand the scope of Buddhism, uh, Buddhist impact in Chinese society without first looking at, uh, looking into Buddhist women's lives uh, throughout Chinese history. So uh, what about my sources? Um, I mostly use Tang epitaphs. I was able to collect about 6,000 Tang epitaphs. Uh, 4,500 of them were for men, but we Fortunately, we have 1,500 of them for women, and among them, I was able to identify 77 epitaphs for Buddhist nuns, and about 200 of them for Buddhist laywomen. 
Tang in the Tang Dynasty. So a typical Tang Dynasty epitaph describes the subject's family background, early experience, major events in his or her life, and this person's achievements and the virtue and the spouses and the children, as well as a burial arrangement. And it concluded with a poetic eulogy to uh, describe his virtue and or her virtues. So in commemorating this deceased person, Tang epitaphs regularly portrayed a overly idealized person, usually ex exaggerated uh, uh, personality. Therefore, in my opinion, they provided not only um, a rec record of personal lives, but also a reflection of Tang ideology in gender, in moral standard, and everything else. Um, I intended to have five topics in my proposed book. The first one is identities and the lives of Buddhist nuns. And my second topic, my second topic is identities and the lives of Buddhist lay women. And the third topic is Buddhist women's religious experience and the practices. And I wanted to examine how Buddhist nuns and the lay women um, exhibit their faith through every stage of their lives as daughter, as mother, uh, as wife and mother, and so on, um, both within and outside of the religious order. And my fourth topic is Buddhism in the configuration of Tang gender ideology. I try to uh, find out that as Ch Chinese Buddhism reached its pinnacle during the Tang Dynasty, um, in what way not only did religious piety came to be an important element of Tang perceptions of female virtue, but also religion itself also became um, to be credited as a source for women's moral inspiration. Um, for example, in my study of Tang epitaphs, I find that during the Tang Dynasty, female virtues traditionally attributed to Confucianism, Confucianism now became a source of uh, 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 Buddhism, uh, Buddhist faith. For example, benevolence, we all know it's a Confucian idea, but benevolence is also a Buddhist concept. Also, frugality and understanding and so on. Um, likewise, widows who decided to remain unmarried were often said to be following the Buddhist idea or tenet of asexuality instead of Confucian idea of widow chastity. So that's another example. Finally, I wanted to examine women's role in the signification of Buddhism. And I wanted to establish a link between the successful penetration of Buddhism in Tang China and women's active teaching in domestic spheres. So um, I just wanted to explain a little bit how my work will contribute to the understanding of the uh, uh, Buddhist history in China. Um, scholarly, um, scholars have long argued that the success of Buddhism in China derived largely from the fusion um, of Buddhism and the Chinese philosophies. So we call it a signification of Buddhism. And I just wanted to further argue that um, this signification process actually occurred in two spheres. In the public sphere, it's the, what we call the four Chinese Buddhist schools, like Pure Land, uh, Lotus, and the Garland, and Chan School, or in Japanese, Zen School. So that is the process of signification in the public sphere. But I wanted to argue that there's a private sphere. Um, the signification also occurred in domestic spheres where Confucian householders, ha households embraced Buddhist idea. And in this process, women played a key role. Um, I find, for example, um, from this Buddhist women, both nuns and uh, bay women, uh, their children usually would follow the mother's uh, footsteps to become either Buddhist nun or monks, 
while you, if you look at the Buddhist monks, they're previously, they, they were previously uh, fathers and then um, uh, husbands. Children of these Buddhist men did not necessarily follow their steps. So my conclusion is that um, because women's active role in teaching their children Buddhism, um, Buddh that's why Buddhism survived after uh, Buddhist uh, persecution in 45. I don't know if you're familiar with that event, during which <laughs> more than 4,600 monasteries were destroyed, uh, 260,000 monks and the nuns were expelled from their uh, establishments. So that's my argument. Thank you. <coughs> Well, this is a little bit reflecting my bias for um, the interest in the ways in which these old teachings may influence, um, I guess, modern day women in modern Buddhism in China. If you could comment on that. So today. Yeah, how much you feel or, or can see from the work that you're doing, uh, relationship between the teachings from then uh, in the everyday influence that women have in their practice in Buddhism in China today? Um, thank you very much. It's a very good question. Um, as, as you probably know, unfortunately, I grew up during the Cultural Revolution. Uh, <laughs> after, you know, um, I mean, I was born after uh, 1949 when Communist Party took over China. So basically, when I grew up, there was no Buddhism at all. Um, but, you know, in daily lives, you still can tell um, uh, parents will say, oh, let's pray to Buddha, um, he or uh, Buddha Sattva, he or she would give us blessing and everything. But overall, um, not much impact in daily life. It came back now, sort of, and you, if you visit Buddhist nunneries and you still see <coughs> nuns moving in there and everything. So but not between 1949 to 1990, where, during which I lived there. So. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, I think came for an economical discussion that um, allows time for a question from the audience, if there is one, if anyone wants to join in. Yeah. If you get to know me, you'll, you'll soon realize that I'm always the person with a thousand questions. Um, so what I'm curious about is um, th that the materials that you're using, the epitaphs, um, are, is, how representative are they of people in general? Are the epitaphs something that only are recorded for elite? people or is there a way that you can kind of read off of them to certain other portions of the population? Um, very good question. Um, I think among 6,000 epitaphs, um, most of them were for elite. Only 7% were for commoners, but there are some you know, commoners. And interestingly, a lot of Buddhist nuns were from commoners family, mm -hmm. so more than elite. So it's a very good representation of Tang society. And also I wanted to emphasize that it's very interesting that uh, we can find hagiographies before the Tang dynasty and after the Tang dynasty, but none of them from the Tang dynasty survived. So these <coughs> epitaphs were the only sources for studying Tang women and Tang Buddhism. Thank you. Um, I'm now going to introduce our next speaker, Anthea Butler. Uh, Anthea is Assistant Professor of Religion at the University of Rochester, where she teaches African American Religious History, American Religious History, Women and Gender Studies. And she also serves on the steering committee of the Frederick Douglass Institute for African American Studies and is a faculty associate of the Susan B. Anthony Institute for Gender and Women's Studies. Rochester's a great neighborhood for historical figures. Um, 
her new book, her recent book, Women in the Church of God in Christ, Making a Sanctified World, is a history of the women's department of the Church of God in Christ, focusing on Kojic women's appropriation of the church mother as an avenue for spiritual and civic leadership in the 20th century. Um, Anthea also has an interest in religion and gender and the media, and um, boy, it's a big season for that topic. Um, she has appeared on the History Channel as well as in the PBS television series American Experience episode on Pentecostal healing evangelist Amy Semple McPherson. Um, she also has been on Krista Tippett's Speaking of Faith and she serves as an editor of the online journal The North Star, a journal of African American religion and history. Anthea. Well, the title of my project is The Swamp Angel of the South, Joanna P. Moore, and Holmes' mission work in 1863-1916. But um, I'm going to digress a little bit from how everybody else has done this and say that most of my work is about therapy issues, okay? Um, it's about what I don't do. It's about housework. It's about um, the construction of a perfect family. It's about how to get the nice boyfriend. It's about how to find a nice husband, you know, all the things that you know, are very intriguing to me, but I just never seem to be able to do 100% well. So, um, and it's also about mothers, and I love my mother, and if she ever sees this tape, I love you, Mom. But it's also about moms, and about, you know, what do you do with your mother, and all these sorts of things. And Joanna P. Moore struck me as a very interesting kind of mother, because she was never a biological mother. She was a single woman who actually went down to the South, um, about 1862 and ended up in a place called Island Number 10 that does not exist anymore in the middle of the Mississippi River. And she left there from uh, Rockford Seminary in Illinois. And she heard a talk by a man that came in who said to her um, in a speech, he said, you know, nothing else will do except a woman for this kind of task to go down south. And that's how she m began to make her journey down into the southern regions from Illinois and spent the rest of her life serving African Americans in the South. Now you might wonder why is it that somebody who teaches African American religious history would be interested in writing about a white woman? Well, this is not any white woman. She's an extraordinary person. And what's extraordinary about her is that she made a choice at a very difficult time in the, post, in the Reconstruction period to live among African Americans in Louisiana and later on in Nashville, Tennessee. And what struck me about this story was not so much about her, but about the changes that she went through as a result of living with African Americans. For one thing, she had, you know, the sort of time period racial ideas, and she said that God had to heal her heart from her own racism. And I thought that that was interesting to read this, because a lot of times when we read missionary narratives, missionary narratives tend to be very pejorative towards the people that they're serving. They're always about, you know, these benighted, you know, dark peoples of Africa or wherever it might be, and, you know, there's all sorts of things wrong with them. And Joanna P. Moore had a different take on that, and I think what I find very interesting about her is that this commitment to live among African Americans and work with African American men and women changed her. It changed her and it changed the people around her. My project specifically is to look at three things. One is her life, and two, she has a, actually has an autobiography called In Christ's Stead, where she tells a lot of these stories. But what I find very interesting about that autobiography is that it's not peppered with pictures of her, it's peppered with pictures of African American families. And um, sort of also stylized pictures about what she thinks should be happening. So one of the things that I sent in with my project was a picture of a little white boy protecting a black girl. And the caption underneath said, her little protector. And I thought, this is a very interesting thing. Why would somebody draw something like this? Why would they ask for this to be drawn? And so one of the things that I'm looking at is the material production of what Joanna P. Moore produced as she published several things, not just books about herself, but books about um, courtship and marriage. One's called Kind and True. Of course, you're supposed to find a man who's kind and true, right? You know, somebody won't cheat on you. I think that still applies today. Um, the other thing that she did was to start a magazine called Hope in 1884 in Plaquemine, Louisiana, which is right outside of Baton Rouge. 
And this magazine is very interesting because it was meant to do two things primarily. One was to teach African Americans to read by teaching them a Bible scripture and giving them a little teaching for the day that they could look up in a Bible. And two, to start something called Bible bands, which were home study groups. But hope became much more. It became a vehicle for African American women to sell throughout the South, to sell door to door, to sort of engage in home missions work. And this became sort of the um, front piece or the foundation of a whole series of things that she produced, like fireside schools and all of these things. And actually, for a time, the magazine was produced by um, R.H. Boyd, who some of you might know was the publisher for the National Baptist Convention, and that was in 1900. So I'm curious about these intersections that she has with African Americans. She turns up in lots of different places, and all the archival work I've done, I'm just amazed that you know you see her one month in Arkansas at a at a mother's meeting, and the next month you find her at Spelman and Morehouse in Atlanta, and she's talking about temperance issues, and she's also talking about African Americans in education. So what I'm really interested in, and I want to close with this, are, are sort of four things because I think. Uh, Moore's life encapsulates all of these. And some people already heard a little bit of this if they came to my class today. The first thing I'm interested is in no. What are people saying no to? And Joanna P. Moore has a very stern look about her, and she's always saying no to something. You know, no to acting up, no to not being clean and having a, a, a clean house, no to um, a drink, no to lots of different things. And so I, I find no is a really good way to get at some important questions, especially when you're writing about women, because it's the no's that give more answers than what you're going to say yes to. Second thing is working class. I'm more interested in not so much elite women, although elite women cross in the story. I'm interested in women who are working everyday women. I'm interested in poor women. How do you get those voices back into the canon? And I think that's a really important reclamation project to try to get those women to have a voice because we tend to think of women who are educated and are leaders and have positions and ordination and all of that. They're the women we, we want to think about, but they're women who have just as much power and authority within their religious traditions, and they don't have a lot of money. Um, and that also draws into the third thing, non-ordained. Um, I like to look at women who don't take the usual path to getting power. I like to see people who wrest power away in different kinds of ways. And then finally, the women who sort of subvert, use this as a subversion tactic. In other words, how could Joanna P. Moore have done all the things she could have if she'd been married? There's no way in the world she'd been able to travel the way, the way that she did if she had been a married woman during this time period. By remaining single, by sort of eschewing all this life that she writes about that you should really have, that she didn't have, she had the opportunity to move in circles that she would not have had otherwise as a white woman in the South. And so I think those are the kinds of questions that I'll be bringing to this project this year. I'm not going to make any claims about how far I'm going to get. I know I will write something. I know it will be a book at the end of this. And I know I have to deliver something to Professor Brody, and I will. Thank you. Just ask me a question. Wow. Well, I have a lot of questions. But actually, you answered some of them. And I'm going to ask you a question that's not even on my question list. So one of the things that um, I noticed um, about this fascinating person you're looking at is that she lived and worked basically throughout the second half of the 1800s and into the early 1900s. And that was a, a period of incredible change around um, no, uh, gender norms. And so I wonder if you can tell us a little bit about how as she moved through her life and, uh, and sort of made decisions about how she was doing her work and how she was doing her life, can you see those larger shifts going on, larger historical shifts operating in that? In the other women she's working with, not in her. Okay, she's a hard hit, all right? And so I think one of the things is that she is very because of where she's coming from and what I didn't say is that there's a there's a theological battle that's going on underneath this. She actually is um, is part of the American Baptist Home Mission Society, but she's become um, holiness. But she chose to remain within the American Baptist rather than go out into a sort of another denominational construct. Because of that, there's a big resistance to the changes that are sort of happening and the freedoms that women are getting. 
So she is not advocating for those at all. She's really more concentrating on the sort of home life and the production of studying the Bible and all that. So I would say that she is not doing that. And however, the women that she's working with, like Virginia Broughton and others, who play a pretty big role in this book, begin to have changes. And there are also women who have not had the same kind of background. Virginia Broughton actually was the first African-American woman who graduated from Fisk. And she plays a big role in the story. And so I find her as being the more sort of liberal wing of the story. What I think is good about Moore is that even though she's very much entrenched in sort of a 19th century ideal about womanhood, she allows other women to be around her that are not necessarily espousing to that same thing. That sort of leads to the question I have, which is what was the reaction to the people that she worked with? Particularly, what did other white folks think about what she was doing? A lot of them are mad. Um, And and what what about the African Americans? African Americans, um, what's interesting about it is that some, especially the time right after Civil War that she's working down in New Orleans and in Plaquemine and all these places, because she stays there until about probably 1886, 1887, they're, they're welcoming to her. Whites call her all sorts of names. And one of the things that happens after Hope is first published, within the first three or four months, she's running these Bible band schools, and they burn down the place that she's working at, and they beat up the black pastor. And this is the precursor to the KKK. It's the white league who, who does this. So whites are very much not in favor of her. However, I should say that by the time she dies in 1916, she has a funeral that... Um, surpasses 7,000 people at the Ryman Auditorium in, in Nashville. And she is buried in the Black Cemetery in Nashville, Greenwood Cemetery. So, I mean, she's, she's very much loved by African Americans. And, and this time, whites pick up a little bit more, but it's, it's, a, it's a very difficult road for her. start to get a sense of what happens when this group gathers and we discuss our work in progress during the year. It's pretty interesting. Um, Well, I don't know this group yet. We haven't done it yet, but I'm starting to see, judging from years past, where this is going to go. Next, I'm pleased to introduce Coralyn Davis, who you just heard from very briefly. She is Associate Professor of Women's and Gender Studies and Anthropology at Bucknell University where she teaches courses on women and gender studies, as well as courses on feminist anthropology, women and development, which we'll hear about today, and women and the penal system. Um, she, her work, she has done a lot of field work in Nepal with a very little known um, group of people who she will tell you about. Her work there initially focused on issues of women's development and tourism, and she published a number of articles out from that direction, and she's now turning to look at this, um, the the expressive work of these women from the perspective of religion. So, Coralyn. Hi, it's great to see you all. Looking forward to working with this group and with this group um, as the year progresses. So my project is called, well, the proposal for my project was called Subjectivity, Subalterity, and Agency in Maitil Women's Religious Expressive Practices. Don't worry, that will not be the name of the book. Um, and obviously it sort of forefronts the kind of big, heavy theory stuff. Um, but I want to start in telling you about my project by forefronting something in the latter half of that title, uh, Might the Women, and who are these folks? Um, I know that there must be some people in the room, in fact I know there's at least one person in the room who um, knows a lot about Nepal and South Asia. Are there some other South Asianists or people from South Asia in the room? Okay, so that's helpful for me to know. Um, So let me kind of give you a bit of a mental map of of where I'm working. So uh, first of all, this is a a region that um, now is intersected by the border between Nepal and India, the state of Bihar in India. And so you probably know that Nepal is this rinky-dinky little country kind of smashed between India and China uh, or Tibet. 
Um, and it's just about like if you took a globe and put your finger on where we are now, now and then sort of went halfway around, that would be it. Um, and uh, so this region is um, primarily Hindu practicing, um, although there's a significant uh, Muslim minority there. Um, the society is very much structured around caste and um, the sort of critical measure of wealth up until very recently is cultivatable land. So whether you have it or you don't makes a huge difference. Um, the the uh, primary language there is Maithili, which is a language that's relate, very related to uh, Hindi and Nepali and um, the, the other languages in that area. Believe it or not, there are over 20 million Maithili speakers, and uh, that's a lot of people, and uh, if you're wondering why you never heard of these people before, um, it has everything to do with politics and history, and I'm just going to touch on that a little bit today. Um, so um, what this region is most known for, in fact, is um, its um, part in the great epic, the Ramayana. And, um, and if you ever heard of Rama and Sita, anyone ever heard of Rama and Sita? Okay, all right. So, um, so these guys met in the town where I did my research. Okay. Um, Sita is the daughter of Janak, who was the king of Mithila many eons ago. And, um, and it was through incredible feats that Rama was able to win her hand. And then the story goes on, and Sita has a really, really hard time later on in her life. And I won't tell you that whole, whole story now, but um, the, the area is still very much known um, by people in the whole South Asian region for being a part of this story. And in fact, the, this town, Janakpur, is a major Hindu pilgrimage site and people come from all over um, to go on pilgrimage there and to take part in that kind of living history in this area. So uh, Janakpur and surrounding villages have been the location of my ethnographic work regarding the lives of Maithil women. When most outsiders think of Nepal, they think of mountains and yaks and Buddhists and Sherpas, an image carefully cultivated by Nepal's tourism industry despite the fact that until very recently, Nepal was the only official Hindu kingdom in the world. Yet the Janapur area is primarily Hindu and secondarily Muslim and lies at 200 feet above sea level with rice paddies, mango trees, ponds, and water buffalo, no yak, yak cannot live and breathe in this low altitude. Um, it's absolutely beautiful, but it's not Himalayan beautiful. Um, bicycle rickshaws can and do easily operate there because it's flat as a pancake. Uh, the, in the, the months just before and after the monsoon season there, uh, it's just miserably hot. And during the monsoon season, it's frequently flooded and buzzing with malaria carrying mosquitoes. In the 1990s, the Peace Corps stopped sending female volunteers to this region because these women consistently complained that they were unable to get respect from their local male counterparts and because of the degree of street harassment they suffered. Eventually, due to political unrest, the Peace Corps pulled out of Nepal altogether a few years ago. In Nepal, things have been pretty rough politically in the last several years. Some of you may have heard of the Royal Massacre in 2001. How many of you heard of that? Okay, a few of you. Um, which signaled the beginning of the end of the monarchy in Nepal and the Maoist insurgency, which given that the Maoists were designated as terrorists by the United States, has had the remarkable result of the political splinter party turned revolutionary movement turned political party just recently winning the majority of seats in parliament. In this process of political transformation, Michael people, as part of a larger regional and ethnically related group called Medeshis, have started to have increasing success in making claims on and demands of greater representation in the Nepali state. All of this has affected least of all, of course, my field work, as there have been years of periodic transportation and communication, shutdowns, bombings, street protests, and uh, street clashes. Aside from one German doctoral student in the 1990s, no scholars other than myself have, to my knowledge, published ethnographic research in the area in the last two decades. 
I'm not telling you that to set myself up as some kind of hero or idiot, but to try to explain why there's so little recent ethnographic work coming out of this area and um, what people there are up against in trying to enact their lives. So what's the nature of my project? I'm interested in Maite women's expressive practices, what some people have called folklore. Maite women are known to outsiders, if at all, for one or two qualities. For being oppressed on the basis of their gender, and this is by United Nations type measures such as literacy, agent marriage, ability to own property, and such. And for, on the other hand, the second thing is for their beautiful artwork, to which attention was brought through the work of a non-governmental organization and state sponsorship on the Indian side of the border beginning in the 1960s. Subsequently, Michael Women's painting and crafts in Nepal have been promoted as tourist art through a women's development project in Janakpur, and my doctoral research in the 1990s focused on that project. In trying to understand Michael Women's perceptions of themselves, as well as their social and sacred worlds, Originally, so that I could understand their relationships to the development project I was studying, I started to solicit stories, not just personal stories, but folk stories, stories that women tell to one another and their children while they're working in their courtyards, and stories that they tell in conjunction with rituals and festivals in which they participate. For instance, the funders of the development project that I studied, drawing on Western feminisms, wanted to get the project participants to think of themselves as a sisterhood. It was a cooperative of women. Desiring to understand how this idea of sisterhood might translate culturally, I started asking women I knew in the project if they were familiar with any locally circulating stories about sisters. And immediately I was told a story about a barren woman who, out of jealousy, chopped off the heads of all seven of her sister's sons. So this idea of sisterhood wasn't resonating exactly <laughs> in this context. Such stories turned out to be the kernel of my current project. Sociologically speaking, my field society is patriarchal, patrilineal, and patrilocal. That is, um, uh, men stay in their uh, home communities and even in their home house, and women marry in to those homes and communities from other communities. That's what patrilocal means. But gender is not, only, is not the only vector of power in Mike Hill society, which is also very much inflected by caste and class and post-colonial status. Furthermore, Mike Hill women and men experience countervailing solidarities as cross-sex siblings, that means brothers and sisters, um, as sisters-in-law with one another in the same household, married to brothers, as co-wives of the same man, and as friends. On a very basic level, I'm curious about how women's storytelling constructs and challenges all of these vectors and how individual women employ storytelling in creating meaning in their lives. I'm also interested not just in the oral, but the visual. And since my heel women paint, which is the basis of the development project I studied, I have employed my heel women in making painted illustrations of many of the stories I've recorded in the hope that putting these diverse modes of storytelling, oral and visual, in conversation with one another will provide further insights. One of my favorite parts of, of uh, my field research was um, kind of getting storytellers and painters together to figure out on their own how they could best sort of interpret visually what was going on in the stories. In the most abstract, on the most abstract level, I'm interested in women's agency, which has already been mentioned today, um, of which I've seen much there, and in the context of mighty constraints. To me, the idea of agency must be brought together not only with a notion of constraints, the recognition of constraints, and a dynamic concept of social structure, but with a very nuanced way of thinking about subjectivity. I'm interested in the ways that subjectivity is at once collective and individual, sustained and contextually shifting and contradictory. In my thinking about agency and subjectivity, 
I found it useful to include a third term, subalterity. So that's the, the trinity. That's my trinity. The trinity from um, from my proposal title, subalterity, which describes the presence of constructions of the world that challenge the view from above, dominant worldviews or ideologies. I'm interested in how such countervailing understandings might not coalesce in a single story, but only appear as a glimmer of a suggestion in one moment in a story, only to be noticeable again in an instance of visual expression or in the telling of a riddle. My two women, I would argue, do not individually or collectively speak in a unified, resistant, nor for that matter, compliant voice. But I do think that if one learns to listen, to engage well, one can hear amidst the cacophony of voices and visions a different way of imagining the world. Thanks, Corlin. I definitely want to hear and see more stories. So you've whetted my appetite to, to kind of see your materials. Um, but I guess um, kind of where you wound up is, is where my question is. Um, I am not an ethnographer, and I've been fiercely resisting becoming one ever since my mentor in graduate school became one, but I some, someday think I might have to go there. So teach me now. Um, what are the kind of methods you use? Like you said, you got um, storytellers and painters together to kind of um, encourage them to, you know, get illustrate these stories. And so how do you um, see yourself? I mean, I, I, I'm somewhat familiar with terms like participant, observer, but like what, what, where are you standing to kind of interact with and make the observations and do the research that you do? Well, um, the, I think the, the sort of, the, Hmm. All right, let me back up. So I wouldn't have been able to do this particular work without first doing a bunch of other ethnographic work that involved um, mostly hanging out with people. <laughs> That's what ethnography means, did you know that? <laughs> hanging out with people. Um, and uh, so spending time um, with people in their homes as they're doing their, their stuff, trying to sometimes do stuff with people, um, being willing to really look like an idiot, trying to do that. Um, uh, lots of language learning. Um, and, uh, and what happened for me was after doing a lot of that stuff and getting to know people through uh, my prior research, um, I came to know some people who were really good at telling stories. And, um, and then uh, they seemed really eager to, um, to do that with me. I mean, they love their stories, and I love their stories, and it's sort of a, a win-win. You know, that no one seemed very interested in them from the outside before. And, um, and so people started telling me their stories, and, and um, I recorded them. Um, digitally, and then uh, I would meet other people through those people, and I was trying to um, uh, record stories with people who had a lot of different kinds of backgrounds in terms of class and caste and um, educational background and, and stuff like that. And um, uh, and so the storytelling um, sessions. Uh, some, of, some of them that I did were very um, unnatural in the sense that, you know, I made appointments with people. Um, and, uh, and sometimes there wouldn't be anyone else around and we would just be face to face and they would be telling me stories. And sometimes um, it, this was happening more <clears throat> in a context where there were a lot of folks around and, you know, people were shelling peas or um, you know, taking care of babies. Uh, someone would tar start telling stories and other people would, would come around. Someone, a little kid would go next door and get the women from that household and they'd come over and we all sit down and everyone's hanging out and there'd be a lot of interruption and people would disagree about how the story went and, um, and it was very interactive. Um, so uh, I would ask a lot of questions like I told you, I was, I'm a big question asker in almost every context. Um, and um, 
Does that give you a picture? It does. <laughs> all for your patience. Um, it will be well rewarded. In our last speaker, I'm very happy to introduce Namachia Hernandez. Um, Namachia is an in independent scholar who taught most recently at the University of California at Berkeley. Uh, her interests are in Native American philosophy and religion, gender, cosmology, and epistemologies. And her, as well as research methods in Native American studies. She's a specialist in Native American cosmologies with a focus on the Blackfoot and the Blackfoot homeland that spans northwestern Montana and southern Alberta in Canada. Uh, after completing her uh, master's degree in teaching and curriculum at the Harvard Ed School, she went to Georgetown University where she studied applied linguistics and then returned to Harvard um, for her doctorate in education, which focused on Blackfoot philosophy. Um, and that project it will be the topic of her first book, which is expected later this year. Um, and she will tell you about the new project she's working on, on Blackfoot women. Namach. Um, well, after all this talk about stories, I feel like just getting up here and telling stories. Um, but um, I'm doing a project uh, that's a long time, sort of a long time ago, probably before I even realized I began in that um, I'm calling it Blackfoot Women in the Religious Life on the Western Frontier changing roles and maintaining traditions. And it's focused on the ways in which the ancient teachings and traditions that we've learned through our ceremonies in particular and women's ceremonial roles as guided by our creation stories um, continue to guide and to educate women uh, in the modern world, I guess I will say. Um, but I, I have to say that it really probably, my education in the area started uh, as a youngster when I was already uh, active in the ceremonial life of the Blackfoot, given that that's where I grew up. And so as far as the stories, I think about stories that I was hearing around by the women. And of course, the younger women are taught by the older women. And so whether it was somebody complaining about a younger woman who wasn't doing something right or a younger woman complaining about why do we have to do this it's so ridiculous this isn't the way you know it's not the most efficient way or it's not the most um, direct way to do things or I don't see the point of this like why do we have to wear a scarf in ceremony we never wore headdresses you know anything about, like a scarf that covered our head before the white man you know so then that would start a three-hour conversation about <laughs> whether or not we need to be wearing uh, babushka style scarves which is exactly what they are they're straight from from over there and and um, you will we'll still have these conversations and it could go on for four or five hours and people discussing whether this is right or wrong and whether this is an imposition due to colonialism or whether we are just trying to protect ourselves from the sun and the wind or whether we look better or worse with the scarves on. So, <laughs> so, um, so those are the kind of uh, beginner type level uh, stories that I was exposed to as a young woman. Or, for example, we have very strict rules in um, Blackfoot society for women when you're cooking in the kitchen and when you're able to serve at a ceremony and things like that. Um, and I observed things like I'd be working in the kitchen and one of the elders would pass through and make sure that all the young women were doing everything just so. And once when observing that one was taking shortcuts, um, I, I watched her get into trouble. She was corrected, she was instructed again, she was told this is the way you do things. And of course, the minute the elder stepped out, she started complaining and saying, well, no, yeah, no, 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 here's my shortcut. Well, when the elder returned, that was the last time that kid was in that kitchen preparing food because apparently she was not ready to uh, abide by the order of the way that it's supposed to be. 
So those are the kind of things that initially I think exposed me and got me interested later on in my project, which is um, a review of historical literature, uh, beginning with the sort of pre-anthropological days. Uh, in some senses, it, it begins with the missionary documents, but it's also the traders and the trappers and the proctors and the um, Royal Canadian Mounted Police officers and captains and such uh, like people. Um, and occasionally, people who were working later uh, to organize the national park system or to um, commissioners involved in the signing of treaties, for example, and their reports of what was happening. And the documentation that's available about women began with a very general uh, categorizing where often they'll refer to the indigenous women and you won't even know from reading it whether they're from a specific tribe or from many or several. They won't name them. They will just say the women or the hag <laughs> or or the, you know, the, there are somewhat derogatory reports. Uh, they are kind of um, not very positive and not very defined. And later on, um, as the missionary efforts continued on and the, the forts were shut down for the fur trade and things like that, uh, the whiskey trade calmed down a little bit. Um, then there became a very strong effort to uh, make sure that the women were indoctrinated into the various forms of Christian religion that was coming with uh, a particular attention because it was deemed that the men were not going to be the ones raising the children and therefore if you wanted to get this view of the world across you were going to have to make sure the women knew it so that they would teach it and in the upcoming decades and century uh, that uh, opinion and justification motivation etc really pushed forward um, a very stringent, very difficult time for the Native women in particular, um, those who were trying to maintain uh, any semblance of their traditional uh, practices, and, and that included arresting grandmothers who were going out to set up the Sundance. <laughs> um, in, in our societies at home, the women actually camp before the rest of the, the uh, religious societies come out and they do so because there's a Buffalo Women's Society that's in charge of doing that. And for example, that society was really harassed by the Royal Canadian Mountain Police and, and things like that. Um, because the commissioners and the, the people working on the reservation were very concerned about the political um, sort of social strife, uh, the fear in a sense of the natives getting restless and, and a lot of ceremonies were interrupted outright um, because it, there, this was during the times of massacres and rebellions and other upstarts were running around and wanting to uh, start a war against the whites. And so it became a very terrible time, um, really from the mid, I don't know, late 1700s, but it got, got really bad around 1830 and on until the 1930s. So about 100 years of really hard times. And, and the residential schools didn't, um, closed down really until ni in the 1960s. So, and, and that's just in Canada. And we have um, a, a fairly well, somewhat known history about that. But what I was more concerned about here was how to reclaim, I guess, a sense of, uh, to, to understand and in, in investigate for once uh, what would be. Um, traditional roles for indigenous women in that society that is not necessarily fighting against or fighting within the same uh, constraints, expectations, and demands of, uh, for example, the feminist movement, which a lot of the women do not identify with, do not, and have a hard time with. And I didn't really understand that until I was walking across campus as an undergrad and I was going past the women's center and I was getting yelled at because people were saying, uh, you're so um, oppressed, you don't even know it, you know, within your own religious tradition. So I think that when I'm reflecting on this, I'm really trying to look at the good side of it, which is that there's, um, there are really powerful roles um, outlined for our people, indigenous women, shall we say, uh, and for women in general, when you look at the, the creation myths that are the informing background 
of the roles that women are expected to have. And, and in that, um, I'm going to incorporate Ping's question for me because she had to leave. But she was asking, in my account, gender is an attribute of life-giving forces, specifically the sun, moon, earth, and all the plants, animals, and humans. Would you give an example, such as an expression or a myth, to explain blackfoot gender? And, for example, does that, is it similar to the concept of yin-yang? Well, it's a great question. <laughs> um, it would take more than my five minutes to answer it. But I will begin by saying that there is a... Um, uh, what I've done and what I'm doing with this is I am starting with the history because that's a necessary part of sort of exploring the images, for example, that came, became very popular in, in fiction and in also the anthropology of and in the history of how we documented Native American women's roles, if, if they were documented at all. And, but I'm then going to move into a territory that I think I uh, spent a lot more time on, which, is, which are the traditional stories, in which um, indigenous women um, serve as a sort of, for lack of a better way to understand it uh, or explain it, it's like conduit of life and for life. And so all of the roles, uh, that which they take on in Sundance, that's which they, they have on in the various religious societies that we have. Um, they're functioning more or less as a, and, and a serve that this idea of serving life. And there's a, there's a, it's a concept that I'll get into more in, in my project, but the idea that when we serve life, it's in a variety of, of ways in which um, we express kindness or we express um, humanity towards someone or we express patience or we express care and concern. And those types of values are all within, under the rubric of um, sharing in that sort of universal energy, which is seen as that the universe is a kind place. It might be a tough place, it might be a complicated one, but it's one in which um, serving life actually takes on the meaning that you, when you give to those things that bring up good energy, then you are feeding life. And when you're not doing that, then you are you're, um, basically on the opposite end of, of serving life. So it brings it right back to the concept of how free do you have to be, what are you battling against in the, in the notion of what it means to be a, a defined woman. Um, and, and, and it does so in particular because the idea of serving is one of the first ones you really have to learn in ceremony. And it's seen as a fundamental, uh, basic root of the societal uh, strength. If you can see it that way, which is when you're able to um, humble yourself to serve other people, to help others, to be there for um, those who need you, then that is the fundamental, one of the basic uh, roots of why the society is um, places the women in the positions in which they are placed in, in the ceremonial and spiritual life. So those are some of the things that, um, and again, when it's seen, uh, the historical literature says, well, they're just servants. <laughs> um, what I'm trying to do in this work is to combine this, like, you know, combine the contradictions and really shake out a level of, of what is really true in the definition of woman in Blackfoot. So that's basically what it is. <laughs> I'm happy to take your questions. Yeah, but I think since Ping is gone, <laughs> uh, we can take a question from the audience. If there, if there's a question. Yes. Um, I should be raised in the Native American church have myself facilitated change, but as well as delved into the creation story and the mythology of where they come from. Um, have you experienced, and this is what I fear to step into, a lot of dissent from your own people or your own the women in your community as far as um, your research goes? As far as, you know what I mean? Like some people don't like to expose these, these stories or they don't like to expose mm -hmm. the internal strife that was in. Oh, you're asking if, uh, if people have are against what I'm doing, my research, basically, or no? Yeah, I, well, it's just, it comes from a fear that I have as far as um, 
writing about my community and some of the issues we have with it. And, yeah. and being very careful as far as what I present. To oh, I see. Well. I understand. Um, well, actually, not really. Um, and that's because the topics that I've chosen are um, the ones I listed in my what I've decided are going to be the chapters are really based on a lot of years of work with these women and in that community and in those circles and as a member of those societies. And I think I definitely know there's a borderline of what we should or shouldn't share and what we can share really effectively. And I think that you, that's probably the number one thing that they would they say, well, you know, we'll trust you to know that line. There are people who don't know that line. Uh, some very well-known scholars on the topic don't know that line as far as they're concerned. But I think the, to the um, idea that, for example, we'll be looking at ideas of repatriation and what they mean, and I say ideas of repatriation because this is one area that I want to cover in the book, but in, even in the interviews that I've been doing, which are ethnographic, um, I've gone out and I've spent the time with these women and sat with them and some of them have said, I'm so glad you're doing this because for goodness sakes, it's been so long, we haven't had a chance to speak. Or other ones will say, you know, I'm really interested in the sisterhood. And they don't mean just Blackfoot women or even just all women. They mean uh, a sense of that combination of energies that brings forth life which would be, in other words, a new way to look at who we are and who um, sort of, I, I think, as a people, as people and as human beings. And that's where the connection to the cosmic stuff happens because it's not, it's seen uh, as if there are energies in the universe that are feminine and male, masculine, and we are simply the reflections and the conduits of that manifested energy. That's kind of how it's, it's looked at. So as long as I'm talking about, say, when we talk about repatriation, they're saying, well, we might repatriate objects. And that's the definition that a lot of people have, the understanding they have about what it means to repatriate. But for us, once we've repatriated an object that we can then incorporate into a ceremony where we then teach values, what we've repatriated are the values, you know. So it's, it's a much more expansive way to do it. And I think that when you do it with a real critical eye and, and, and a lot of care. I think you can do it really well. Yeah. Thank you. Well, um, I get to work with these women all year. You will get to hear them each give a lecture at some point in the year to, uh, on the progress that their research is making and take their courses. So. A, a great year to all of us, and um, we look forward to seeing you at, at the lectures throughout the year. Thanks. <laughs>